quite an honor to be um, on stage with such an esteemed panel. And, and congratulations to Chicago and the Ideas Festival for pulling together such talent because uh, we do know, and, and it has been clear from each speaker, that we have challenges. There's a lot to do, and status quo is not working when it comes to how we have conducted ourselves on criminal justice policy. So I stand here as a career prosecutor, a very proud career prosecutor. And by way of background, I will tell you, I'm also one of two children who was born to parents who met when they were graduate students at the University of California, Berkeley, in the 1960s. And they were both very active in the civil rights movement, which is how they met. My sister and I joke that we grew up surrounded by a bunch of adults who spent full time marching and shouting um, about this thing called justice. And frankly, the heroes of that time, we all know, among the many, were Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston and Constance Baker Motley. So when I thought of that, I thought that's what one should do. I want to be a lawyer. I decided that at a very young age. After going to Howard and graduating from Hastings Law School, I was very excited. My family gathered around, OK, Kamala, what are you going to do in your fight for justice? And I very proudly told them, I have decided I'm going to become a prosecutor. <laughs> You're laughing because you have a sense of who my family is. For example, my sister went on to head the ACLU. <laughs> so my family, at least, at best, found my decision a bit curious. And with some of them, I had to defend the decision like one would a thesis. And here's what I said. Then and now, after a career, over at least a couple of decades as a prosecutor, law enforcement has such a direct and profound impact on the most vulnerable among us, and has as its responsibility, as its job, to be a voice for the vulnerable. And in the process of giving safety, has the responsibility also to give dignity. So I decided that's the work I wanted to do. And I went straight out of law school to what was considered one of the best DA's offices in the country. You got a good one here in Cook County, but Alameda County. Earl Warren once headed that office. And that's where I started my career. And I've prosecuted everything from low-level drug offenses to homicide. So I stand here with that experience and that perspective. And as we talk then about ideas and what we need to do to reform the criminal justice system, I would suggest that we should think of it in a way that also appreciates the false choices that have been presented. And in particular, not only the false choice about whether there has to be some trade-off between civil liberties and civil rights if we're to have public safety, but also a false choice in general that says on criminal justice policy, you're either soft on crime or you're tough on crime. I suggest we instead ask, are we being smart on crime? Which recognizes a number of factors, including, as has been discussed, the need to infuse metrics in the conversation, look at what our, our wonderful business leaders talk about all the time in assessing their effectiveness, what is the return on our investment, in particular in a system that we're putting billions of dollars a year in this country into, our criminal justice system. Let's look at it and measure it in terms of its effectiveness. And in that way, build criminal justice policy. But I would suggest to you that when we do that, we cannot overlook some of the realities of what we're talking about. Because criminal justice policy and what you do about crime is very different than what you do in terms of how many widgets you need to process. For one reason, if no other, and I'm gonna step back to, to, to first put it in, in a larger context. What is the purpose of innovation? And why do we engage in it? Well, innovation by definition is bringing to bear some new device, you know, who has their new iPhone 5, um, some new approach, some new method, right? All in the, the, the pursuit of efficiency and effectiveness and doing something better. We don't engage in innovation. It's not the pursuit of just something new and exciting because we're bored with the old thing. It's because we want to do better. So let's talk about innovation in law enforcement and therefore criminal justice. So we do something different, for example, in terms of how we approach someone who is in the system and we decide looking at the metrics, looking at predictors, forecasting, we say, okay, we're gonna do something different with this guy that we have in front of us today who's in for, let's say, a minor misdemeanor. Do you know the challenge for every law enforcement leader, every elected district attorney, every elected sheriff, 
the challenge and the concern, the fear, always, is that we will do something with that low-level offender that might be about education and less incarceration, job training, mental health, and that person will go out tomorrow and kill a baby and a grandmother. And then everyone will look at us and they will say, Madam District Attorney, Mr. Police Chief, Mr. Sheriff, why did you do something different with them when you had them? Because you see, when we engage in innovation in law enforcement, it necessarily means we're doing something different with someone who's on our screen, on our radar. And the only reason they're probably there is because they committed some kind of crime. So part of what is then involved in innovation in law enforcement is a high assumption of risk. And part of what I would suggest we need to do to encourage more innovation in law enforcement is, is, is set the table and the plate as a society, as, as opinion leaders, as, as the voting public, to say we encourage you to do that. And we understand how innovation works. I am a native Californian. I'm very proud of what we do in California, including what we're doing in Silicon Valley. Well, the culture there is very clear. You know, my mother was a scientist, so, so I, I have a full appreciation for what scientists and engineers do. I grew up in a household where the word hypothesis was used all the time. Okay? So, when you run for elected office, however, you are expected to have the plan, capital T, capital P, the plan. And then you roll out the plan, and you defend the plan no matter what its defects, because you had the plan, and so it must be defended. Versus what innovation understands. Let's start with a hypothesis. Now make sure it's well-intentioned, well-thought-out, well-planned. But what we know in every situation almost, when we roll it out for the first time, there will be a glitch. But we have accepted that in places like Silicon Valley as part of the culture. We expect there will be a glitch. Don't make the same mistake twice, please. But then go, reconfigure, and let's tweak it and improve it and roll it out the next time. The luxury of that experience, the reality of that process is not afforded to people who, generally speaking, are in elected office or law enforcement leaders. So part of what needs to happen is we need to give law enforcement the ability to try out, experiment, and then give them a little capital, a little space to say, okay, there may be a glitch, fix it, let's reconvene. Another challenge I think we have when it comes to innovation in, in law enforcement and therefore in criminal justice is the, the way that we have approached the issue which has mostly been centered on the criminal case instead of the crime problem. So I'm a career prosecutor. You heard stories about specific cases and then we heard statistics in general. So when I was a career prosecutor I was handed a file. I specialized for a while in child sexual assault, some of the worst crimes you can imagine. My only focus when I got that file was that case, and I'll tell you if I was ever a vigilante DA, it was in that case. Lock this person up because I believe the facts are here and the evidence is here to prove them guilty. That is the right approach for the criminal case. It's a very different situation when as the elected DA for two terms in San Francisco and now the chief elected law enforcement officer of the biggest state in the country, when I think about the crime problem very different from the criminal case. But for too long we have allowed criminal justice policy to evolve around the specific case. So what ends up happening is we have a conversation that is fueled by what we feel here, rightly, our concerns here, rightly, our fears here, based on that case, instead of looking at the numbers, looking at the numbers that you've heard already. So part of the shift has to involve, one, identifying how we have approached it and realizing that, as I know it, as a career prosecutor, you know, I see crime as on a pyramid. At the very top of the pyramid, the worst crime. There for an obvious reason, homicide, child molestation, the worst cases you can imagine. They're there at the top of the pyramid because they are the most outrageous of offense. It, 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 the, the cost to the victim and the community is great and it needs to be a priority. Thankfully, at the top of the pyramid also, the fewest number. What is occupying the bulk of what is in the criminal justice system is at the middle and the base of that pyramid. 
But we have approached a one-size-fits-all approach to crime, even though crime is not monolithic. I would suggest we could make great advances just by having people automatically, when they hear, and Eva did such a beautiful job of just showing us images and then challenging us in terms of what our immediate reaction is. I think we could go a very far distance if the immediate reaction the general public had to criminal justice policy discussions would be to say, okay, wait a minute, you person running for office or whoever else, are you talking to me about violent crime or nonviolent crime? Let's just start there, just as a beginning. Let's bifurcate our brains and our thoughts into is it violent crime or nonviolent crime? Understanding that generally speaking, the approach should be different. We can't have a knee-jerk response that's lock them up to every type of crime as though they are monolithic or it's a monolith. Uh, the other piece of it is this. So yes, I've already shared with you, I mean, I was born in Oakland, California. My parents were there, Berkeley in the 60s. I have friends like Eva Patterson. Okay, so I say with all love and warmth <laughs> that part of the concern also for people who, um, who are progressive thinking and liberal-minded, or just progressive thinking in terms of just fix it, fix it, is that we all have these posters in our closet that is attached to a stick that we sometimes will card out when we're talking about criminal justice policy and those statistics that you first heard when we opened it up, incarceration, and we run around with these signs, build more schools, less jails. Build more schools, less jails. And we walk around everywhere. Build more schools. We protest. Build more schools, less jails. Put money into education, not prisons. There's a fundamental problem with that approach, in my opinion. And it's this. I agree with that conceptually. But you have not addressed the reason I have three padlocks on my front door. So part of the discussion about reform of criminal justice policy has to be an acknowledgement that crime does occur. And especially when it is violent crime and serious crime, well, there should be a broad consensus that there should be serious and severe and swift consequence to crime. That, I think, is essential. And by the way, it's, it, it, when you just break it down, uh, everybody agrees. You know, although I'll tell you a little story, I've got five minutes. Um, one year, it was, long, it was many years ago, I was speaking before the San Francisco Democratic Party, the annual meeting, and it was a Saturday. I'd done a bunch of events, so I got there and I was a little tired. And I got to the podium, and I looked out at the San Francisco Democratic Party. And I just stood at this podium, I kind of leaned over, I was just exhausted, and I'm looking at you know, the, the glorious party that it is, right? So it's like the black guy with the blonde hair, the white guy with the dreadlocks, you know, the, the lady there with the purple hair and all the buttons, right? And I just looked at it, this fabulous Motley crew, and I said, okay, so who of us as Democrats, raise your hand, is saying people shouldn't have to go to jail? And you could see these hands just start to run up. I said, hold on. One human being kills another human being. A woman is raped. A child is molested. Is that what we're saying? So the knee-jerk response was to suggest we don't want law enforcement and public safety. But that's not what we mean. So that has to be part of what we talk about in challenging ourselves in terms of where we're coming from when we talk about what needs to occur to improve the system, to agree that status quo is not working. The next part of it then has to be, okay, we can outline criticism. What's the solution? Because it's not, it's not not having jails, because there are people who do bad things who need to go to jail. And some people need to go to jail for the rest of their life. But it has to be about looking at and understanding the system well enough to know how we can then build into it those things that can create improvement. And then that comes down to a number of issues, including what we all need to do when we want to improve anything, which is have a, a, an ability to embrace and endure the mundane, right? We can talk about broad policy approaches, but let's talk about some specific issues also. And this gets back to the last discussion about cybercrime. We really need to support the ability and the desire of law enforcement to adopt technology. 
That's a very real issue. When I was first elected district attorney in San Francisco, it, that was back in 2004, kind of long ago, but still, San Francisco, first class city. Do you know two thirds of my lawyers didn't have email? The San Francisco Police Department is just now rolled out email. What many of us who have done law enforcement or have been in government can tell you is that when you pull back the curtain on the way we're operating, sometimes it reminds me of that little guy at the Wizard of Oz. It's amazing we get anything done. So we can talk about these broad policy goals, but we also have to pay attention to the mundane which is the detail of how you would implement that. We can talk about gathering statistics, absolutely. We have to judge criminal justice policy and law enforcement and effectiveness based on matrix, not based on some blind adherence to tradition, which is how we tend to do it. But how are we gonna measure if literally the technology is not in place to get that done? So in terms of the details, part of the discussion has to be how we're gonna probably do work that will be Public-private partnerships, because you know, I was going to say a bad word. Shoot, um, California is on the verge of bankruptcy. <laughs> you know, I, we just we're looking at huge cuts. So you know, and I'm sure that that Rahm Emanuel and whoever else can talk about the same concern, which is we don't have a lot of extra resources, but we also have to realize that actually we'll end up saving money in the not so long run by in the infusion and adoption of technology by all these systems, but in particular law enforcement. If for no other reason also, because a large part of what law enforcement does is communication based. That's how we solve crime. That's how we talk across jurisdictional lines when we need to talk to law enforcement partners, be they uh, state and federal, if you're talking about from local, or just across jurisdictional boundaries. So what we know about technology is that's one of the best things it gives us, is the ability to communicate effectively, accurately, efficiently, and quickly. So I'm gonna leave that idea with you as one of many. I wrote a book, it's called Smart on Crime. I've got more there. Um, but essentially, I think that there is a lot to be done. But I also, let me just be more explicit, strongly, strongly believe that to have this discussion in a way that we produce outcomes means having law enforcement at the table. Because you can talk about reform of a system, but sometimes that's from the outside in. We also need innovation within the system, and we need to rely and depend and include and, in, and involve our law enforcement leaders so that we can actually see these reforms take place. And that's where I've had a great experience of working with lots of sheriffs and DAs and police chiefs who want to do that same thing. And, and, and I know that, that all of you support them in their desire to do it, but it really will take a whole community to fix the crime problem and to do what we need to do around bringing smart ideas to law enforcement in a way that we pursue innovation. It's going to be a whole community working together. Um, and in that way, I feel very optimistic about what we can do. We've done some great programs in California where we've shown that we can change the outcomes. And, um, and with that, I want to thank the Chicago Ideas Festival for your great work. Thank you.